Wonderful. So let's look over what we did last time. So last time we were going back to covering spaces. So going back to how we originally computed the fundamental group of the circle. And we said that uh, covering spaces are maps um, for which x has an open cover uh, with every element of this cover uh, evenly covered by p, right? So i.e. Um, open sets, open subsets, u, such p inverse of u is a disjoint union of a bunch of sets v, and uh, p restricted to any one of these is a homeomorphism. Okay, and then we spend some time talking about uh, how covering maps have important lifting properties. Right, so the general case corresponds to when you have some map into a space X, and then you have a lift, sorry, you have a cover of that space X by X tilde, and you want to know when is there a lift. And what we saw is that you always have um, necessary that the image of the fundamental group of Y under F be inside the image of the fundamental group of X tilde with respect to P, and if Y is path-connected and locally path-connected, then this is also sufficient. Okay, so um, you want to lift a map to a cover, then the fundamental group tells you if, um, if you can do it uh, and precisely when. Okay, uh, we saw that uh, lifts, if they exist, are unique. And we also saw that um, that covering spaces are related to cosets. In that, if you have the lifting correspondence that takes a loop, lifts it up, and takes the right endpoint, uh, then this uh, descends to a bijection between the image group, sorry, the cosets of the fundamental group by the image group, and the inverse image of a point. So we're going to expand on the relation between covers and, um, and subgroups. So you can think of this as saying one relation between a cover and a subgroup is that if that subgroup is the image of the fundamental group, then the number of cosets uh, is the same as the number of uh, sheets. Right? So in fact, there is a... Um, 
Um, so assigning the subgroup given by the image to the cover is known as the Galois correspondence. So as you all know, uh, Galois refers to Evariste Galois, the, uh, the romantic uh, French mathematician who died tragically in a duel at uh, the age of 21. Uh, and of course, he's famous for, well, for dying in a duel at the age of 21, but also for um, the, his discoveries in algebra that tell you when a polynomial can be solved uh, with radicals. Uh, so, um, as you recall from algebra, uh, what Galois theory tells you is that the, um, the let's just say it, it gives you a relation between ext field extensions and subgroups of the Galois group. So this is known as a Galois correspondence because it's very similar. We're going to have uh, relations between subgroups of the fundamental group and covers of the space. Right? In fact, you can make this uh, relation um, uh, more than just an analogy. Um, so if you're interested in how, how these things um, can end up being the same, uh, you should look up uh, Grothendieck's version of Galois theory. <clears throat> okay, but in particular, uh, what we're going to show is that for suitable spaces x, then uh, given any cover, sorry, given any subgroup of the fundamental group, there is a, let's say, unique, in quotes, so unique equivalence class, a cover of x uh, with h equal to the image of the fundamental group. Okay, so that's what we want to do. Uh, given a subgroup, construct the cover, and then later talk about um, equivalence classes of covers and uh, relate that to the subgroups. So if h is equal to 1, so if h is trivial, Right. Remember that we proved that P star is an injective map. So if the image of uh, this subgroup is trivial, that means that this subgroup was trivial to start with. So if H is 1, then um, this is a cover with X tilde simply connected. And as I mentioned last time, uh, that is known as a universal cover. Okay, so so as I said, this is only going to be true for suitable x, right? So. Let's think about the case h equal to 1 to figure out what, what a suitable x should be. So what can you say about x if you know that there is a cover that is simply connected? So in that case, if um, so given a universal cover, If U is a, an open set evenly covered by P, uh, 
um, let's say, and v is a slice of u, then any loop in u lifts to a loop in v, um, right, an actual loop, because uh, p is a homeomorphism between uh, v and u. Right? So, so if you lift a, lo a loop that was entirely contained in u, then that lift is entirely contained in v, and it's, again, a loop. Um, but of course, since x tilde is simply connected, uh, this loop is null homotopic. I don't know if it's null homotopic in v or not, but it's null homotopic in x tilde. Um, and hence, the original loop is null homotopic in x. Again, I don't know if it's null homotopic in u or not, but it's null homotopic in x. And how do we know that? Well, take the null homotopy upstairs and just project it down with p, and, uh, and you will get uh, a null homotopy uh, downstairs. <clears throat> so another way of saying that is that um, if we include this set in X into X, um, so if this is the inclusion, then the um, the image of the fundamental group is trivial. So this is equal to 1 in pi 1 of x, or 0. It's the, a trivial subgroup of pi 1 of x. So let's turn that into a, a definition. Let's say that a space x is semi-locally simply connected if each point x has a neighborhood uh, such that the uh, inclusion sends its fundamental group um, to the trivial subgroup of uh, the fundamental group of x. Right? So again, you have a loop in u. And we're not saying that that loop is necessarily null homotopic in u. Right? u might have uh, a bunch of holes or whatever. We're saying that if you take that loop and you view it inside x, then it's null homotopic there. OK? So uh, of course, this is uh, a new word for us, semi-locally. Uh, and the thing is that if we were to say locally simply connected, this would not mean the same thing. This would mean that you have locally connected uh, little neighborhoods, right? So that would refer to uh, having a loop in U uh, be uh, null homotopic inside U. So that's why we call it something different. Uh, not every space is uh, semi-locally simply connected. But nice spaces are. An example of a space that is not semi-locally simply connected is uh, a space called this, known as the Hawaiian earring. Earrings. <clears throat> so this looks like we're in, in the plane and we have a bunch of circles, uh, each one of which is tangent to the y-axis. Uh, so 
this is uh, the union uh, over n in the naturals of the circle of radius 1 over n and center 1 over n. Right? So it's a bunch of circles in the right half plane that all go through 0 and are tangent to the y-axis. Right? So if you look at uh, a neighborhood, any no neighborhood of the origin um, has this property. Because right? no matter how small a neighborhood you choose, there is some circle that lies entirely in that neighborhood and going around that loop is, uh, is not null homotopic in that neighborhood or in the entire space X. Okay? So this is an example of space that's not semi-locally simply connected. Uh, we have many examples of spaces that are, so just think about any manifold, for example, a surface. And if you have any point, then it has a, a neighborhood that is um, uh, homeomorphic to a, uh, a neighborhood of the origin in Rn. And, um, and so it is contractible in particular. And so this property holds um, staying inside the neighborhood. OK, so what we've seen is that if you have a universal cover, then it must be semi-locally simply connected. OK, so here is a very satisfying theorem. If x is path-connected, locally path connected and semi locally simply connected then it has a universal cover okay so this necessary condition is enough for spaces that are path connected and locally path connected. Okay, so we're going to prove this by directly constructing the the universal cover of X. Okay, and we're going to construct it by using the uh, the fundamental groupoid, right? So. So notice the following. First assume that x has a universal cover. Um, and let uh, x not tilde be any point here, then for any other point there's a unique path homotopy class of paths from x not tilde to x tilde. Right? So remember, if you think way back to when we first defined simply connected, we justified the name by saying that if you have a simply connected space and you pick any two points on that space, then a path between them, any two paths between them, are uh, path homotopic to each other. Right? So 
That's why it's called simply connected. So there's, there's just one choice of path homotopy classes of paths between two points. <clears throat> so the points in X tilde are in one-to-one -one correspondence to the path homotopy classes of paths starting at x naught tilde. Right? Of course, this is because it's path connected, so you can join any two points by some path. But by the path lifting property, uh, this is the same as the path homotopy classes of paths in x starting at any fixed point x0. Right, because if you give me a path homotopy, classes, path homotopy class of paths in x tilde, I can project it down to x, and I'll get a path homotopy class of, um, of paths in x. And vice versa, if you give me uh, a class here, I can lift it uniquely to a class up here. Right? But what's wonderful is that we ended up with a description of the points in x tilde that only used x, right? So now, if you, even if you don't assume that you have uh, a universal cover, you can start with this set, the path homotopy classes of paths in x starting in x0. So let's turn this around. and define x tilde as a set to be the path homotopy classes of paths, right? So that's an element of the, uh, the fundamental groupoid of x. And we'll just demand that the, um, the left endpoint be some fixed point x0. Right? So, path homotopy classes of paths in X, and we're just demanding that the left endpoint be fixed. Okay? Um, this has an obvious map, uh, where you just assign to each class the right endpoint. Right? We know that's well defined because it's a path homotopy class. So the endpoints don't change. OK. <clears throat> so we have the right set. We know it's the right set because if we did have a universal covering space, then the points would be these, would be one-to-one -one correspondence with these. So we need to define a topology. on x tilde uh, that makes p continuous, first of all, and a covering map. OK, now we need to define a topology. Uh, one very convenient way of defining a topology is to define a basis for the topology. So let me remind you. A basis for a topology on some set Y is a collection B of subsets satisfying two properties. 
first, um, they cover y, and secondly, if you have two elements in B and you have any point inside the intersection, then there is another element of B um, that's contained in the intersection and contains the point Y. Okay, so uh, given a basis, uh, if you let tau be the subsets of y uh, that um, can be written as unions of sets in B, Um, then tau is a topology on y. So on the one hand, this is great because it, it gives us a, a way of defining a topology uh, by a, a nice class of subsets. Also, it makes it easy to check if a map is continuous. So um, in this case, a map from Z, some space, topological space Z to Y, whose topology is given in this way, this is continuous if and only if uh, the inverse image um, of a set is open for the elements of the basis. Right? So to check continuity, it's enough to check that the uh, inverse image of an open set is open for open sets in the basis of the topology. OK, so here's our plan. We're going to choose a basis Bx of a topology, um, which is based for the topology on X, right? So X, which is already a topological space. Uh, then what's going to be special about these is that for each, say, U alpha in this basis, we'll decompose. the inverse image under P as a collection of subsets of X tilde, right, indexed by some index beta uh, with P restricted to any one of these a bijection. And then we'll show that um, Bx tilde consisting of all of these putative slices is a basis um, for a topology on x tilde. Okay? If we can do that, it'll follow easily that uh, P is uh, a covering map and continuous. Uh, and then we'll worry about x tilde being simply connected. OK, so that's our plan. We need to choose a basis so that P behaves as if it were a covering map. And then um, and that'll give us a basis for uh, x tilde that actually makes it a covering map. OK. OK, and how we're going to choose this uh, basis for x uh, should be pretty clear from the hypotheses 
we assumed. Right? So we assumed that x was path connected, locally path connected, and semi locally simply connected. So let's let Bx be all of the subsets of x such that uh, u is path connected. And the inclusion sends the fundamental of a group of u into the trivial subgroup of the fundamental group of x. Okay, so uh, our hypotheses guarantee that um, x is a un the union of all of these u's. Right? Because we know that every point in x has a neighborhood that is path connected and that has this property for the fundamental group. OK, we want this to be a basis. We have the first property. We need the second one. OK, but locally path connected. <coughs> Excuse me. So if u1 and u2 are sets like these, and y is in the intersection, well, since this is an open set, the uh, locally path connected uh, property tells us that there is some su open subset of x that contains y and that is contained inside this intersection and is locally and is path connected. So um, then there is an open set inside this containing. Y that is path connected. OK, so great. That's almost enough to be in here. We still need to check this property. Um, moreover, if you have this and you want to include it inside x, well, that factors through the inclusion of any one of these sets. Right, so if I have a point in here and I want to include it in x, I can include it in u1 and then include it in x, and I get the same thing. Uh, so since this diagram commutes, then the corresponding diagram of fundamental groups commutes. So that tells us that the image of this fundamental group inside here along the inclusion is contained in the image of the fundamental group of uh, u1 inside here along its inclusion. Right? But the image of this group in here is trivial. So uh, the image along its inclusion of the fundamental group of v is trivial inside the fundamental group of x. Right? So those two properties together tell us that v is in bx. And so bx is a, uh, a basis. for the topology on x. Right? So that's the first step. We found a basis. Now to make sure that this basis is good for us, we need to check that uh, it, it, um, the inverse image of one of these sets uh, breaks up into these slices for p. 
So given call it u alpha inside bx, well, by definition, the inverse image of u alpha is the disjoint union over uh, points in u alpha of um, homotopy classes of paths in the fundamental groupoid of x with the property that the left endpoint is x0 and the right endpoint is x. So, okay, that's what we get as a set, the big set. Uh, we want to, to break it up into subsets, right, with the property that when you restrict any one of these subsets, you get a uh, bijection, right? So, what we're going to do is define an equivalence relation here and look at the equivalence classes under this relation as these slices. So let's say that two elements of this inverse image are equivalent in U alpha, or with respect to U alpha, If there is a path contained entirely in U alpha such that the composition, the concatenation, sorry, the concatenation of um, a representative here with G gives you a representative here, right? So, Two classes are going to be equivalent in U alpha if, um, if there's a path that's contained entirely in U alpha that'll take you from a representative in one class to a representative of the other. Right? Of course, I could take the, the um, uh, opposite path, so this is a symmetric relationship. <clears throat> so I'll let you check that this is, in fact, an equivalence, class, uh, equivalence relation and we'll write numerous view alpha equal to the composition, the alpha beta, uh, for the decomposition into equivalence classes. Equivalence classes with respect to this relation. Right, so to be more specific, to be more explicit about these guys, we can say that if, if you have any path in one of these, then you can write this equivalence class as the path homotopy classes f dot um, g, um, the homotopy group or in the fundamental group of x, uh, such that uh, g is a path in u alpha with um, g of 0 equal to f of 1. Right? So as soon as you fix one path that goes from x0 and lands you inside u alpha, then the equivalence class is just uh, all of the paths into uh, points in U alpha that go from X naught into U alpha along the path you started with, right? So equi different equivalence classes correspond to different ways of going from X naught into U alpha. Once you get into U alpha, then the elements of an equivalence class are just going from uh, the point in U alpha to another point in U alpha while staying in U alpha. Okay, so um, because of that, it's easy to see that uh, P 
from any one of these equivalence classes to u alpha is uh, bijective. All right? Because surjectivity is just because u alpha is path connected. Uh, while for injectivity, it's because um, if, you, if you take the inclusion of u and you map in the fundamental group of u, then this is trivial in the fundamental group of x. Uh, that is to say, loops in u are contractible in x. Okay. So the key fact here is to remember that these homotopy classes, path homotopy classes, are in x, right? So I'm allowed to do any homotopy I like anywhere in x, right? So if I have, uh, to show that it's injective, assume that you have two elements here that map to the same point in u alpha, right? So this map is just looking at the, at the right endpoint. So if you have two elements in here that, um, go to uh, the same endpoint in u alpha, that means that I have, um, if I do one and then go back along the other, what I have is my path f that gets me into u alpha, and then all I'm doing is putting a loop at the end, but that loop stays entirely in u alpha. So this loop is, um, it's not contract, no homotopic. This loop that I have here at the end is null homotopic inside x. So I might not be able to, to homotope it away staying inside u alpha, but I don't care. I can homotope it away inside x, and this is a path homotopy uh, class inside x. So I can just remove that, and that's why it's injective. Okay. So wonderful, we've got a basis for the topology on X, and it, uh, it does have this property that it breaks up the pre-image of P into slices that then uh, P puts in bijection with U alpha. So what we need to show is that if you just take these slices as subsets of X tilde, you get a basis for a topology, and then that topology will, will make P a covering map. Okay, so let B X tilde be all of the V alpha beta defined in this way. Okay, so um, so we want to show this is the basis of a topology on x tilde. So uh, the first part is easy. So clearly x tilde is equal to the union of uh, B alpha beta, where you take the union over alpha and beta. And that's because the U alphas cover x. And if you take all of the V alpha beta for a given alpha, you get the preimage of U alpha. So this covers all of the preimages of all of the U alpha, so it covers all of X tilde. On the other hand, if Y in X tilde um, is in the intersection, of two of these sets, then um, first uh, find u in the basis of x such that uh, p of y 
is contained in um, U, which is contained in um, U alpha intersect U beta, uh, alpha prime, right? Where, of course, U alpha is the projection down of B alpha beta, and um, U alpha prime is the image of B alpha prime beta prime. All right, so because we know that we have a basis for x, we can find a basis element that sits inside the intersection of these two elements. So then let uh, v in the inverse image of this basis element uh, be the equivalence class. containing y then since equivalence in u implies equivalence in uh, u alpha and equivalence in u alpha prime then um, we have the v sits inside V alpha beta intersect V alpha prime beta prime uh, as required. Uh, so, um, so this is a basis, and with this topology. This is a covering map. Okay. Um, right. And so, why why is this true? Well, remember, equivalence in in U just means that you can um, uh, the the two paths that you're looking at differ by a path that stays entirely in U. Right, but if you have a path that stays entirely in U, then you also have a path that stays entirely in U alpha and a path that stays entirely in U alpha prime. And so um, that's why being equivalent with respect to this implies being equivalent with respect to both of these. Okay, so we get a topology and we have a covering map. So wonderful, all that's left is to check that this um, total space is simply connected. Okay, so <clears throat> given our base point in X, let um, well, let's call it uh, X not tilde be the uh, the lift of the constant loop um, in x tilde, right? So x tilde consists of path homotopy classes of, uh, um, of uh, paths starting at uh, x naught. So the constant uh, path starting at x naught is such a thing, and so it has an equivalence class, and we'll just let that be the base point upstairs. So let's, let's look at what it, how it looks to lift a path from x to a path on x tilde. Right? We know it's a cover, so we know that it is possible to lift a path, and in fact, there's a unique lift of a path as soon as you fix the base points. So here's a base point, and here's one uh, a point sitting above it in x tilde. So let's look at what the lift of a path starting at x naught looks like starting at x naught tilde. So given. Um, given a point 
and x tilde. So remember that f is a, a path in x uh, starting at x0, and this is its path homotopy class. So let f sub t be the path obtained um, by restricting f to the interval 0 t. Right? So f1 would be f, and f0 would be the constant loop at x0. So then t maps to the path homotopy class of ft is a path in x tilde uh, going from um, the class of f0, which is x0 tilde, to the class of f1, which is the class of f, uh, such that uh, P of um, FT is equal to FT at 1, which is just F of T. So this is the lift of the path F. of f is f tilde, zero one x tilde, t goes to the path homotopy class ft. OK, so that's how you lift the path. Uh, now we know that the image under a covering map uh, is um, consists, let's say, consists of the classes of loops uh, that lift loops at x naught in x. That lift to loops at x0 tilde in x tilde. Okay, So let's say that you have such a thing. Let's let f be in uh, this image. Right? That means when I lift it to a path, so when I do this, then I end at x0 tilde. Right? Um, this implies that f um, tilde of 1 is equal to x0 tilde. But f tilde of 1, according to this, is precisely the class of f. And um, x0 tilde is the class of the constant loop. So we see that if you're in the image, then you are path homotopy equivalent to the constant loop. And that's exactly what it means to be the zero element. All right, so um, so this shows that this is zero in pi 1 of x, x naught. But since we know that the induced map by a from a covering map is injective, if the image is just a trivial element, then this group has to have been the trivial element. Right. It's a trivial group. Uh, thus, 
x tilde is simply connected. And that shows that it is the universal cover. Right? So uh, that shows that um, if you have a space that is path connected, locally path connected, and then has this new property, semi-locally simply connected, then just looking at uh, path homotopy classes of paths in x that start at a given point, that gives you a space x tilde that has a natural topology that makes uh, the endpoint map uh, a covering map from a simply connected space. So you have a universal cover. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, but we started out by saying that we were interested in showing that every subset, every subgroup of the fundamental group corresponds to a cover for reasonable x. So just looking at um, the subgroup equal to the identity, just the trivial subgroup, um, we found conditions that make x reasonable, and we proved that you have such a thing. Um, so it turns out that once you have this, the, the general case follows. So corollary, uh, if x is path connected, locally path connected, and semi-locally simply connected, then for every subgroup of the fundamental group, there is a cover. Let's call it x tilde h to x with p sub h and a point x not tilde in x tilde h, such that <clears throat> the image of pi 1 of x tilde h with this base point is equal to h. OK, so notice the statement says that there is a covering space and a point. Right, so um, you, you'll recall that if you change base points, then it, we have a, an isomorphism between the fundamental groups. And that isomorphism is given by conjugating by the uh, homotopy class of a path joining the two base points. So of course, uh, the, the base points we're interested in all lie in the same um, fiber above a base point for x. So that path joining them descends to a loop. So it turns out that um, if, if you were to pick another base point, then you're not guaranteed to get this subgroup h. You might get a subgroup conjugate to it within the fundamental group of x. Of course, if h is normal, then th that subgroup is again h. But if h is not normal, then uh, you might get something else. Right? But what this says is that if you pick the base point appropriately, then you will get h. For normal subgroups, again, it, it, the choice is irrelevant. OK, so proof. So let x tilde be the universal cover that we just constructed. And let's define an equivalence relation with respect to h <clears throat> so 
So this is for two points in X tilde. Uh, if <clears throat> um, so f of 1 is equal to f prime of 1, and the loop that you get. So remember, points in x tilde are path homotopy classes of paths in x that all begin at the same point, x0. Um, so here we're asking that they have the same right endpoint. And so that lets you concatenate one with the uh, inverse path of the other one. And, um, and so that's going to give you a loop at x0. And we're demanding that that loop be inside h, which is a subgroup of pi 1 of x, x0. OK? So if that happens, we'll say that these are equivalent. Right? Now, this is an equivalence relation precisely because h is a subgroup. Right? So um, uh, a loop, a, a point is equivalent to itself because you have the identity. A, um, if you have um, f equivalent to f prime, then f prime is equivalent to f because given an element in h, you have the inverse. And because you can multiply in h, you have transitivity. So this is an equivalence relation, and we define um, x tilde h to be the equivalence classes, x tilde mod out by the h equivalence. Notice that um, the map p that we defined on the universal cover, uh, remember that just takes the right endpoint of a curve. And any two uh, equivalence classes that we're identifying with this relation have the same right endpoint. So the map P descends Which is to say that um, we have you know, x tilde, and you can map down to x tilde h just by taking the equivalence class with respect to this relation. And you can map down to x, and this is a commutative diagram. OK, so in particular, um, it descends to here, and it's still a um, a covering map with the topology induced on this from x tilde. <clears throat> so if we use as base point uh, the one we used last time, so, so take this x tilde, um, well, what did I denote it? Just x tilde. This base point, this, the, um, the equivalence class of the constant loop at x0, then the image of the lift of a loop is a loop precisely when its homotopy equivalence class is equal to the equivalence class here. Um, but the equivalence class of this constant is precisely h. So that shows that we have uh, a cover for H so that the image of the fundamental group is exactly H.
Okay, so uh, let's do an application. <clears throat> so here's an application to algebra. Let's go back to the example we had last time of uh, cover of the bouquet of two circles. Right? So when we were looking at that, I pointed out that because we had a graph, the, um, the covering space had to be a graph itself. So um, let's use that to prove something in algebra. So just note that um, the fundamental group of a graph is always a free group. Okay, so let's, let's think about this through an example. So let's say that your graph uh, consists of the, the one skeleton of a cube. All right, so um, what you can do is pick a, uh, a maximal tree. Uh, pick a spanning tree. All right, so, um, so in this case, for example, we could do this. So a spanning tree, so a tree is a graph where two vertices are connected by a single path. Right, so if you want to go from one vertex to another, uh, there's only one way of doing that. There are no loops or anything, no circuits. And then spanning, what I mean is a, a tree uh, that contains all of the vertices. So uh, it's a fact that every connected graph has a spanning tree. Um, if you have a finite graph that's easy, just uh, pick a vertex, and then um, uh, pick any edge, um, pick, a, pick a vertex, and then inductively, uh, if you've constructed a tree, then either it can, has all of the vertices or it doesn't. So if it doesn't, then pick a vertex that you can add, join uh, by adding an edge and uh, add it. Um, uh, since, uh, since that vertex wasn't connected before, then uh, you still have only one path joining any two vertices. And, uh, and then you can just iterate until you've gotten all of the vertices. Uh, if you have an infinite graph, then you have to use Sorn's lemma. You have to use some version of the axiom of choice to prove that there is a spanning tree, but you can. So once you have a spanning tree, let's call that T, Let um, E alpha be the edges not in the spanning tree. For each, each E alpha, let uh, U alpha be an open set. Um, uh, obtained from T union E alpha um, by um, just thickening it up. Thicken. Thicken up a little. All right. So just thicken up a little. You don't want to include any other edges except the ones that are in T union E alpha. Right. So. So then you're guaranteed that this open set has this subset as a deformation retract. Right? Then apply Van Kampen. So uh, applying Van Kampen, we 
we see that the fundamental group of the graph is equal to the free group of one copy of z for each e alpha, for each edge not in the spanning tree. Right? So if you think at this graph, then we're using as spanning tree these edges Right? So, if you like, this is a contractible set. This contracts down to a point. And if you were to do that contraction, you would end up with a bouquet of loops. And you'd have one loop for every edge that's not in your spanning tree. So the fundamental group is then just the, um, the free product of copies of C, one per each alpha. So another way of saying that is that you have uh, the free group with uh, one uh, generator per each e alpha. OK, so the fundamental group of a graph is always a free group. So then our application. is that every subgroup of a free group is a free group. OK, this, this has a name. This is known as the Nielsen Schreier uh, theorem. Uh, it was proven in 1921 by Nielsen and then 1926 by Schreier. Nielsen did it for uh, finite uh, free, group, free groups with finitely many generators, and uh, Schreier did it in general. So this is true regardless of how many generators you have. OK, the, um, the topological proof is a little bit later from like 1937 or so. It was done by uh, Reinhold Bayer and Friedrich Lebby. Uh, Bayer, incidentally, was a professor here at UIUC. Um, and the proof is very quick, uh, given what we've done. So um, if um, you have a free group, so that's the fundamental group of a graph. The, um, um, every subgroup corresponds to a cover. That cover is, again, a graph. And so its fundamental group is a free group. And uh, since that was an arbitrary subgroup, you're done. Right? So just uh, note that uh, every subgroup is um, the fundamental group. Well, it's isomorphic to the fundamental group of a cover. And every cover is, again, a graph. So <clears throat> let's look at an example. So let's say that we have the bouquet on two circles here. And let's look at a cover with um, two sheets. So for A. We're just going to take two copies. And for B, we're going to have one going up and one going down. Right. So again, the labels that I'm putting up here correspond to what they project down to. These are, of course, different um, paths. These are, these are different paths, for example, upstairs. And these loops are not being identified. Right. So <clears throat> right, we call this x and x tilde. So uh, we know that the fundamental group of x is the free group on two generators, a and b. <clears throat> Upstairs, x tilde is a graph. And so uh, we look at a spanning tree. So for example, there's a spanning tree. Right? It connects all of the uh, vertices. Uh, and um, 
And so you get one generator for everybody not on the spanning tree. So you have three generators, right? So uh, pi 1 of x tilde is the free group on three generators. Let's just say free on three generators. And the image of pi 1 of x tilde is the free group on, and we can see what the generators are. So if, uh, if we pick this as our base point, then let's see, we have this loop, and uh, that gets sent down to A. Then I can go down along B and back along B. So I have B squared. Uh, or I could go down along B, then do A, and then go up along B. So I have uh, B, A, B, B, A, B. So uh, those are the, what the generators map to in, in pi 1 of x. And uh, because it's injective, we know that this is, um, there are no relations between these generators in here, because it has to be the free group on these generators. So um, that shows uh, that the free group on three generators is a subgroup on the free group on two generators, uh, which is sort of remarkable. Uh, and we will stop there and uh, pick it up on Tuesday.